To me, this is always one of the most important sessions of the conference because this is a session where, amongst other things this year, we recognize teaching and excellence with our products and where we recognize the very significant contributions uh, that our volunteers make. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Louisa Lee from Myris College and the Atlas Awards Committee to the podium to uh, present the Atlas Awards and say a little bit about them. Welcome, Louisa. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, first, I'd like to thank Aperio Foundation to sponsor uh, all the Atlas winner each year to come in and present. Uh, Aperio Foundation made this all possible. Thank you. Um, Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Louisa Lee. I'm the co-chair of Atlas um, since 2015. Uh, my co-chair uh, Cheryl Brown couldn't make it this year. Um, just a plus. Uh, thank you uh, to Cheryl. Um, back in South Africa. Um, Atlas stands for uh, Aperio Teaching and Learning Awards. Uh, this uh, organization actually started in 2008. I tracked down all our conference wiki pages. We dated back at the beginning of uh, uh, Sakai. And since then, we went through a lot of changes and improvements in 2015 November to um, recognize the expansion of Sakai uh, with GSEG and everything else uh, we expanded to include all the Aperio tools, uh, uh, Xerti and OpenCast and uh, Karuta, many others. So we changed the name to Aperio Teaching and Learning Awards. Uh, since then, we had a lot of winners each year. We have about three to five of them. Uh, we get representation from well, almost every continent, um, many institutions, and even K-12 levels. Uh, we welcome applications from uh, every educational context. Um, if you are thinking about applying or uh, try to nominate someone to apply, you're definitely welcome. Um, so uh, before I read the winners of this year, I'd like to uh, give thanks to all the peer reviewers um, for the Atlas Board. They work really hard uh, to select the winner each year. We have a couple of them present today, I think. Dina, are you here? Uh, oh, there. Okay, Dina, uh, Sanjian, okay, and Janice. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah. um, okay, so let's start. Uh, so the first winner will be, um, do I, is it already going? Yeah. Okay, right. So the first winner is from uh, Duke University, uh, Denise Comer. Uh, Denise Comer is an associate professor of the practice of writing studies and director of first year writing at Duke University, a scholarship which explores writing pedagogy, writing program administration, and the intersections between technology and the teaching of writing, appears in leading composition journals. Denise regularly integrates various technologies into her face-to-face -face courses, through expansive use of Sakai and WordPress, PebblePad, Google Hangout, WordThread, Wikis, and social media. Denise has led a prolific career in higher education. Among her numerous achievements, she designed a four-credit undergraduate online writing course for Duke University titled Writing 270, composing the internship experience. This course is an innovative, fully online undergraduate course based in Sakai that enables students to meaningfully reflect on and productively narrate their summer internship or work-related experiences using digital rhetoric and social media. Um, so we will welcome uh, Jolie to accept this award. Denise uh, couldn't stay here uh, today.
All right, second, we have uh, Ursula Bernau and Marco Antonio Bernau from uh, Mexico. Uh, so we are very glad that uh, we discovered their work. Uh, I say discover, it sounds like. <laughs> um, so uh, they are back in Mexico and they have an extremely successful organization called Age of Red. Um, Ursula Berno is the CEO and a project director. Uh, she studied physics at the science faculty UNAM and started work in distance learning in 2001. Uh, she's passionate about education and innovation, leading efforts to help bring out the potential of people and organizations through openness, usability, strong communications, dependability, and reliability. Marco Antonio Berno is the director of technology. He also studied physics at the science faculty UNAM. Uh, as part of the URED team, he leads several software development teams and work with several institutions expanding the services of Caruda portfolio to incorporate a broader suite of technology platforms. Uh, they developed this uh, online course, Diploma in Experimental Science, in online uh, created for Oh, sorry, created by Science Faculty UNAM and sponsored by Costec SAP. Uh, it provides high school teachers with innovative tools for teaching of experimental science, climate change from an inter interdisciplinary perspective, approaching the teaching and learning of science through the perspective of scientists. Um, uh, they have lots of subjects in physics, health, chemistry, psychology, biology, and geography. Uh, the development and utilization of a Sakai boosts the effectiveness and efficiency of science education and the collaborative learning in Mexico. They have about 6,000 high school uh, teachers, and uh, at the beginning, the course uh, completion rate was about 15%. But after a year, uh, the completion rate uh, raised up to 70. In some courses, even 88% uh, or 90%. So considering how massive this course is, uh, they had a great um, efforts to bring this uh, course. So welcome, um, Ursula and Marco. Third coming up stage is Dr. Jennifer Robinette, uh, my colleague at Marist College. She's an assistant professor of communications and public relations. She has been teaching college communication classes since 94 and teaching online since 2010. She's quality matters trained and a QM peer reviewer. She has built award-winning courses and project sites and served as a judge for the Marist College Teaching with Eiler Innovation Awards. Dr. Robinette earned her master's degrees in communication from Marshall University in 96, and her PhD in communication and information studies from the University of Kentucky in 2011. Uh, her dissertation is on understanding interactive experiences. Her award-winning course, Introduction to Communication, is a purely online course. It is a virtual threshold to the communication major at Marist College. Um, all communication majors are required to take the course in person or online, and students from many other majors take it as an elective. Um, when developing a new site for the class, iLearn Tools enabled her to bring theory to life from students by creating experiences with communication theories in action that would be impossible in a traditional classroom. These interactive activities involve online skill challenges and a ref reflective tasks soliciting feedback from family and friends to cultivate self-awareness, theory application, and critical thinking skills. Um, Jennifer, congratulations. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you. Time now to hand over to my friend and colleague Anthony White from the University of Michigan, who is the chair of the uh, Aperio Fellows Committee. Hi, everybody. Uh, as, as Ian said, I'm Anthony Whiting from the University of Michigan. Uh, there, there are a lot of people out in the crowd, I think, who remember me. I'm something now, a little bit of a historical character in the, in the, life, of this, in the life of this project uh, and, and, and this initiative that we now know as Aperio. Uh, I've, I, I'm historical. I, I've, I've, I'm a bit of a peripheral character. But there's one thing that I have uh, uh, been in really insistent on staying involved with, and that is with the Aperio Fellows Program, which early on was known as uh, the Sky Fellows Program. And what I want to do today is, is really three things. First of all, I want to introduce the new 2017 Aperio Fellows who happen to be in the crowd. Um, secondly, I am going to um, share with you um, just as a, a short series of numbers uh, that, uh, that shed some light into the history of the uh, of this fellows program and also I think um, ask some interesting questions about uh, and raise some interesting issues about both the fellows program itself, um, Aperio as a whole, its future, etc. Uh, and that part of the presentation um, I'm going to demand audience participation, okay? So, um, and, and I, will, um, I will actually confess that I've already seated the crowd with, with a few people who if there's silence they will respond. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the third, the third uh, part part of this will be, of course, to, to, there's a few people to, to thank, and uh, um, I will mention those in the end too. But what I would like to do first of all is uh, is announce. Uh, well, it was announced earlier. Uh, this this uh, this year's crop of Aperio fellows. We have we have three of the fellows actually in attendance today. And what I'm going to ask once I read out um, read out the names is that the three fellows actually come up because uh, one of the cool things about becoming an Aperio Fellow besides the, besides the stipend, the, there's a modest stipend that goes along with it, which is really kind of nice and handy. Uh, there's also um, the recognition that you get from um, the community itself, and, but then there's also this kind of thing, the swag that comes with it. Uh, and of course, we've got, um, we've got some uh, Aperio Fellows uh, gear that um, I'm desirous to, to, to hand out. So uh, with, with uh, with no more delay, let me just go ahead and run through the names. Uh, first of all, the, the first winner is Adrian Fish from Lancaster University in the UK. Um, Adrian is a long, long time contributor to um, Sakai, but over the last um, 12 months or so, uh, which is sort of the time period that the, that the fellowship um, selection committee looks at, Adrian's done a lot of work um, and made a lot of contributions uh, in, the, in the area of Sakai, both uh, uh, both in the core uh, work and in and in some of the contributed work as well. Uh, so he was um, he was selected this year. He's not here. Uh, and the second person I'd like to I'd like to call out is, is Benito Gonzalez from Unicon. I believe Benito's here. At least I did see him. I thought it's over, it's over here. Um, you're welcome if you'd like to um, come up um, if you feel comfortable. I'd actually like you to come over here because what the cool thing one of the other cool things is just handing out this gear it's really just uh, it's really great um, so Benito so Benito's from Unicon uh, and Benito's been a long time contributor to the U portal effort and as you know that hey uh, Benito's a long time contributor to the Unicon effort uh, and uh, I'm to the U portal effort. And the cool thing about Benito's nomination, it was the first of its kind, is actually I received it as a GitHub gist, uh, which <laughs> I was one of two that I received in that. No normally, people just send back a little Word document, but I got a gist, a private gist back, um, which, which laid out the rationale for why Benito should be uh, selected. And again, the committee thought uh, that the, uh, the nomination was indeed worthy of recognition. Uh, the next person I'd like to, I'd like to um, call up is, is Dee Dee Hurricane from Marist College. Uh, Dee Dee also...
Didi's a contributor to Sakai, um, particularly focusing on, on quality assurance and leads in, in that area. Uh, and her nomination, um, it was, I think, the second year in a row that she'd been nominated, and, and uh, we were all ready to, uh, to select Didi. And indeed, she's, um, she's got the gear now. The next person I'd like to just recognize, um, unfortunately he's not here, is Ron Mitchell from, from the Zerdi Project. Um, and Ron, um, as, as well as Benito for that matter, represent those, um, those projects that lie outside of um, this, uh, this world of Sakai that has previously dominated the, uh, the, fellows, the fellows stream. And uh, it's exciting actually to, to receive, now, and we're gonna talk about that a little, receive nominations from, from projects and communities that lay outside the sort of like traditional, um, <coughs> excuse me, the traditional streams of, of nominations that we get. So uh, Ron Mitchell uh, uh, representing Zerdi. Uh, the next person who's also should be in the audience is Miguel Pellicier. Uh, and Miguel, if, are you here, Miguel? Miguel, come on up. Miguel is another uh, a longtime Sakai uh, contributor, and what, what's important about Miguel, in a sense, what he, in, what he represents is, is, this, uh, is the internationalization. Yeah, get that on, man. Yeah. And he represents, you know, he represents, a, along with Ron as well, and, and, and although Adrian's been around for a long time, but, that, but this increasing internationalization of, of Aperio. Uh, as, a, as a force for good throughout the world and not simply in, in North America and some of the traditional places. And Miguel, uh, <laughs> excuse me, has played an outsized role um, in promoting Sakai uh, within the Iberian Peninsula and elsewhere. And uh, so, again, we wanted to recognize his contributions and his efforts, and I'm glad you were here so that we could hand that to you. Uh, and then the final person that I wanted to, um, I wanted to call out is... Um, is Sven Stauber uh, from Switch, which is a which is a Swiss outfit, um, and his work uh, in OpenCast, and he was uh, he was um, strongly supported by one of our uh, one of our one of the first fellows. Uh, uh, I th actually think it was the second cohort of fellows, but Stephen Marquard, who's um, who regularly nominates. Um, uh, compelling people for uh, for this award, and and of course when Stephen when Stephen speaks, we listen because we have got a great deal of respect for for the um, for his observations on, on people's contributions and the value that they place. All right, so we're through this now. Let's see if we can move on here. All right, there's a number here. Uh, quickly, um, within the context of the appello, uh, of the Aperio Fellows um, uh, awards. What do you think this number represents? Total, total. Yell it. Total, total. total number of fellows. These are the total number, well actually not the total number of fellows, actually it's 68, but there's the, the total number of fellowships awarded since 2006, 70 have been awarded. Uh, probably, maybe people knew this, but I would, have, I would imagine that people don't. So there's 70. Now, early in the, back in the day, we, we actually used to allow um, people to win more than once. Um, and so we have a couple double uh, winners. Uh, the rules were changed. And so there's actually 68 winners, but 70 fellowships. Now, if we move on to what I'm going to call the modern era. So the modern era is since the foundation of Imperio. All right? Of those 70, 32 have been awarded during the modern era. Now, what's this number represent? Just a guess. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I didn't know the significance of 42. So, Sakai, Sakai, that's right. All right. Um, some ways that the little percentages should be a little bit of a giveaway, a little bit of a hint. Yes, uh, since 2006, uh, 49 of the 70 uh, fellows that have been, um, uh, that have been chosen um, have uh, come as a result of their work on the Sakai project. Now, in the modern era, in the modern era, 17 have been selected. And as you can see, the percentage um, has, is now beginning to, uh, beginning to move in the direction that I think begins to better reflect the fact that Aperio is actually a community of projects uh, and, and a community of, um, 
uh, in which we have a, a diverse set of, of uh, people working on a variety of different initiatives. And our hope as a nomination committee is that that, that percentage over time continues to drive, drive itself down to what should be a sort of a more natural um, uh, set of distribution across the projects. And we're not there yet, but just something to keep in mind. So, anyone have a guess on this number? Five, four, three, two, no. No, no, okay. It's the number out of the 70, so out of the 70, this is the number of fellows who are um, affiliated either with a commercial affiliate uh, or um, you know, aren't, don't have an institutional affiliation who have contributed to, to uh, the efforts um, across the years and have been recognized. Now, in the modern era, it's 13. Now, what, what's interesting about this number, um, and, and again, it's something that I, I want people to think about from the standpoint of, uh, actually, there is one or more scholarly articles that could be written about this group of people. Um, I trained as a historian, and the actual technical term is called a prosopography, in other words, collective biography. There's a lot to be learned from the, actually the 70 people that have been selected as Sakai and Imperial Fellows over the years. Now, what's interesting about this number and this is actually those ratios. So over, over the history of the project, if I can get back to it, um, not quite 30% of the... Uh, of the fellows have been associated with, uh, with commercial affiliates. But in the modern era, the number has risen to 40. It tells you something about the, the changes taking place, particularly in the development, the developer side uh, of Aperio relative to what I, what I have described in the past as sort of the increasing proxy model, proxy development model that has, that has um, developed over the years. Or another way of looking at it is that some of the very talented uh, Sakai and then Aperio developers um, have, when they were originally in institutions, are now outside the institutions and contributing, drawn out for, for one reason or another. But it's just, an, it's just an interesting number to look at. Now, um, I'm going to share, there's just two more quickly. So what's this number? <laughs> women. Out of the 70, we have selected 10 women since 2006. Now, on the one hand, uh, that's, that's under 15%. On the one hand, that, that could be good, but I want you to look at this number. This is in the modern era. We've selected three. We've selected uh, only 9.3% since, since 2013. Uh, so, so that's a drop there, and it's, and it's interesting. And of course, as I, look, as I look at this, part of the exercise of going through this was, was me as a chair to try to start to reflect, right? So are we doing the right things as a, as a selection committee? Uh, are we, um, um, and then more broadly speaking, and this is what I'm really going to get to in just a second, are we, doing, are we doing right by the people who are contributing to um, all our efforts in terms of people's willingness to actually spend about 20 or 25 minutes out of a day to nominate people? And that's what I want to encourage people uh, for next year. I want to see a slew of nominations that are spread across all of Aperio because ideally, um, and this is just another, another quick number, there's 10 projects within the Aperio. There's nine, um, there's nine in incubation. 70% uh, of those projects do have at least one fellow, but the distribution across those projects is quite skewed in, the fav in, in favor of Sakai. None of the incubating projects um, have really been recognized, although a little deeper analysis, and you could, you could suggest that when Chuck Severance was nominated last year, part of it was a recognition of the SUGI work, though I don't know officially last year SUGI was in, in incubation, so might have slipped that out. Well, this last thing I want to leave you with is this. This is an email, uh, a segment of an email that I got from one of this year's fellows who um, wrote me back to thank me uh, when, once I pinged him and said, hey, you know, you've been awarded an Imperial Fellowship. Um, as you can see in the middle, he said, I'm really, I'm somewhat surprised. He said he's quite active in OpenCast, but I don't remember having, ever being active in Imperial. Now, I, 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 and he said, you know, can you please say a few words about why I'm actually getting this honor? Of course, so I wrote him back. I, I mean, I thought this was self-evident, um, but clearly it's not. And again, and some of the conversations that, that, uh, that people have had during, the conversa dur during this conference, I think sort of speak to some of this. And I just, again, a as an assembled group of people, I want you to think about this. Um, I wrote him back and said, well, you know, from my perspective, 
any activity that you do at the project level, um, any commit that you make, any phone call or meeting that you attend, um, you are advancing the Aperio mission. And so whatever you think you're doing in OpenCast or in Sakai or in Unitime or in OAE, all of that work is advancing the mission of, of Aperio. And it's, and it's important that we make sure that as a community that, that people understand that and that they recognize that while they might have, um, while they might have an OpenCast badge here or a Sakai, you know, a badge on their on their shoulder here. They've got a perio here, and uh, you know. And I just leave that as an observation to you, as a, as a community, to think about that. Because as I as I said before, what I would really like to see next year um, is a lot of nominations coming in from um, across the um, the breadth of this community, um, where people take some time to recognize all the different contributions that people make, because that helps that helps bind everyone together. Um, and helps give people the sense that they are part of, uh, of something bigger than just the, the individual projects. Because, you know, remember, we're, we're all a perio, all right? I mean, that's, that's, for me, that's, that's an important message I, that, that as the chair of the, of the Aperio Fellows community, it's part of really what we're trying to do is to recognize significant contributions, volunteer contributions, and do it within the frame of the Aperio community. So with that, all I would like to do is thank um, the 2017 selection community. Uh, some of them are in the audience. Um, you guys just quickly just like stand up. I know that's always a pain, but just stand up. Matt, Wilma, Matt, Jose, Laura, Janice. These are, these are individuals who, um, you know, who, who, who have, um, who themselves are actually all fellows. They're all fellows. Um, they represent a variety of different projects, initiatives, roles, et cetera. Um, we are working hard, of course, as we, as we extend and we select more people from outside, say, the world of Sakai, we try to draw them into the selection to be parts of the selection committee um, process as well. Uh, and so, again, I want to thank you guys for, for taking the time to participate because it, it is an important activity. And also, again, I also want to thank the people who actually took the time to actually um, generate nominations and send them to us because without the nominations it kind of hard for us to, 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 to pick people right so there's a symbiotic relationship that exists between the community and uh, this committee and we need your help we have to work in partnership going forward uh, and then this year uh, there's a final slide I just want to thank Dr. Chuck Dr. Chuck it turns out actually has made a generous donation uh, in terms of scratch uh, in support of the 2017 fellows uh, stipends uh, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Chuck um, for actually uh, stepping forward and, and doing that. And uh, I think uh, everyone in the audience should uh, recognize him as well. Uh, so hopefully I haven't taken too much of your time. Um, but I did want to draw you in to, um, uh, to think about some of, these, some of these issues that in a sense are surfaced by you know, this, this otherwise sort of fun activity of, uh, of, of, of evaluating nominations uh, and then making these awards and giving out swag and, and, and modest stipends to people that have really done um, some really outsized work over, over the year. But we need your help for 2018. And I look forward to um, the stacks and stacks of nominations uh, that we're going to get next year that, you know, will require us to respond in, in, in interesting and unique ways. So thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and add my thanks to the, uh, to the fellow selection committee. It's, I think, a really difficult job in this community to select a small number from the huge number of volunteers that we have. Uh, I thought in closing uh, it might be useful to draw in some perspectives from attendees at the conference. So I asked a couple of folks to, to come up here and say a little bit about how they found Open Aperio this year and some of the highlights and some of the ways we might improve perhaps. So first of all, Mathilde Guerin from the University of La Rochelle and the Ace of Portail Consortium is going to say a few words. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, right before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful work of the um, organization team. Um, 
as someone who's been in charge of organizing much smaller events in France for our consortium, um, I know how to control it can get and how seemingly insignificant things can make it all go wrong. So big kudos to the people who've put together and coordinated this 2017 edition, really, that was really great and a great experience. Um, so like Ian said, um, about a week ago, he asked me to participate in this closing session to um, share with you all my thoughts and uh, reflection on this year's edition. And honestly, this is not the kind of thing that I'm comfortable doing, so because I like to be extra prepared. And um, I started thinking about what I would say before the conference even started, which is pretty much like cheating at a test, I know. I'm sorry. I'm not really proud of it, but that's the honest truth. Anyway, um, preparing for this conference made me think about, well, the previous superior or even Jessica and Sake events that I entered in the past, and I started listing all the good things that I could say about the events, and um, it made me realize also that I was quite lucky to be able to come every year for these events. Not that I, um, I knew I was lucky, but this year's edition was really great. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that to look forward to each and every year, and um, <clears throat> I mean, you get to meet and chat with truly brilliant and talented people um, who have achieved so much more than I could ever do in a lifetime. You hear passionate people talk about projects you're not necessarily familiar with that maybe you've never heard of, but yet you end up being fascinated with um, nevertheless. And um, you learn new things about projects and technologies you thought you knew through and through, and in the end, there's always something to spark your interest throughout the day, so. Um, yeah, so I guess I won't surprise you by saying that um, this year's edition didn't disappoint me in um, any of those aspects. I mean, just look at the program. Um, I can be the only one who tried to be in two or three different places at the same time because I had a dilemma choosing between sessions and um, I've got to admit this is kind of frustrating on a personal level, um, but this actually shows how engaged and creative our community is and um, also how much the software, the apparel software landscape has evolved and grown over the years. And um, I think we can really complain about that. And <clears throat> When you think about it, uh, the foundation has not even celebrated its fifth anniversary yet, and uh, yet when you look at the progress and achievement it has made, it's quite imp important. And um, with now 10 mature projects and nine currently in incubation, there's no questioning the motivation, dedication, and the creativity in our community. And I think it also proved the uh, worthiness and relevance of our missions and of our shared values. And um, to me, this conference uh, reflected all of that by, for instance, providing concrete examples of institutions from all over the world, um, adopting and customizing the software and contributing back to the community by sharing their codes, their ideas, their feedbacks, their expertise, etc. <clears throat> But the conference has also provided me a glimpse of the work ahead of us, sorry. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, NGDLE stuff. Um, I mean, it's been the subject for quite some time now in our collaboration, in our community, sorry. And, um, and I'm not just talking about Aperio, but in, about higher ed in general. And um, as far as I know, little concrete work has actually been done. So the session that I've attended over the past couple of days um, have made me even more confident that Aperio has the capacities, capabilities, and more importantly, the right people to um, address this major challenge. And um, that's something that I'm actually looking forward to, hearing more about at the conference next year. And um, yeah, at the conclusion, I came up with this um, word cloud, I guess, which represents pretty well, I think, what I heard and learned about during these two and a half days. So I deliberately didn't, didn't mention any specific names of projects or none too many technical stuff because there was not enough space. But 
I think it gives a pretty good idea of what this conference was all about, and um, well, in my opinion at least, and I hope that each and every one of you um, enjoyed it as much as I did. So, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you all for your attention, and uh, I hope to see you all next year wherever we end up going. So thank you, bye. <laughs>
and, and so perfected it that nobody wants to change anything in Paris uh, ever again. Um, I was very encouraged uh, by what I saw the work that UVA is doing on the Add Edit Tools menu to create a more coherent kind of street plan, as it were, uh, for the, the digital learning environments that we inhabit. Uh, Dr. Chuck Sugi project in a, in a different, uh, more fundamental kind of way, addressing these issues as well. And um, the last thing I would say uh, is that I think the metaphor of place is very valuable to us, that we, we don't want to think of the digital learning environment as a collection of tools. We, we live online. It's a place that we inhabit. It's not just a, a, a box that we pull tools out of, put them back into. If you think about it, your own home is a, is a, is a collection of functionalities, but you never think of it as a toolbox. You think of it as a place that has to be inviting, that you want to spend time in, that uh, fits your particular needs and, uh, and habits. And um, I think this is wired in some ways into our concepts of how uh, online environments work in that what do we call the page that's at the center, the hub of a, a set of functionalities? We call it the home page. We don't call it the utility belt page. Uh, so I think one of, the, one of the places we are now is trying to understand what that home, what that city is, is, that we call a digital learning environment is, uh, is, going, to, uh, is going to look like. And I, I look forward to our continuing that conversation over uh, over the next 10 or 12 uh, Perio conferences. Bob, Mathilde, thanks very much for those observations. Uh, I would like to add my thanks to those of Anthony for the program committee for the work that they did in organizing this event. Uh, I'd like to thank Concentra, our conference management services, and I'd like to thank you for being excellent participants. So let's applaud everybody. Like Bob, I was impressed by Malcolm's keynote. I think it grounded the conference wonderfully and set the frame for a a series of conversations over the coming year. Sometimes it is rem it's important to be reminded of the bigger picture, and Malcolm said some very nice things about us as he painted that picture. Someone, I, uh, Martin Murray, I think. Martin, are you still here? I think, did you ask a question that wasn't really answered about what was different now to then? I thought, you might, I thought it might have been you. Well, I mean, What's different from 10 years ago? Well, for me, as someone who is involved in one of those initiatives that Malcolm put on screen uh, the other day, I think that standards have matured considerably, and we have considerably more experience of practical standards now than we did then. I think another thing that's different for me is this view of the incredible shrinking LMS, that the LMS is going to get smaller, but is still there as a choreography, as an orchestration mechanism. And I think that's something that was missing 10 years ago. So I'm convinced that a more flexible and composable learning landscape is possible. Uh, will we do this alone? Uh, emphatically not. We will do it as part of an extended network that we play multiple roles in. So I was very pleased to see Malcolm offer a perio uh, opportunities for partnership, he had a conversation with the board about some of those things, and we are going to take those forward over the next, uh, over the next 12 months. I'd mention one opportunity specifically, because this is coming up within the next two weeks. The Educause Learning Initiative Conference is not like the main Educause event. It's not 8,000 people. It's more like six or 700, focused very much on learning, teaching, uh, and research, and particularly on learning, obviously. A call for proposals for that conference opens in two weeks. And I would like to ask you to think about submitting something to that call for proposals that is a perio related. There, there should be more of us there. It's a place that we should have those conversations. One other reflection I'd offer is we've had some conversations about the marketing thing. 
And the marketing thing is, you know, often, it's a multi-level thing. We think about how we help our projects become marketed better, how we make Aperio marketed better. You probably can't see the figures here. This is uh, from, let me say, uh, a major company in e-learning spaces, IPO, a couple of years ago. So just to get an idea of the, the kind of stuff that is spent on marketing in our space, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I actually find the amount that's spent on R&D in, propor in proportion even more interesting. So, and this is the last time you'll see this photograph, I promise. <laughs> well, for this conference anyway. This might be the answer to more than one question. I think we have to formulate a community response to marketing. We need to improve what we do centrally, and we need to listen to the community about what, how we equip them better. Uh, it's not going to be with $38 million. I think we need to be better at networking our successes. I think we need to be better at documenting our experiences. And we need to tell stories, warts and all, because we're an honest community. We don't have that kind of dishonest marketing spin that one unfortunately sees. So tell stories, tweet, blog, present at other conferences, volunteer to, to help, share what you do. We have an open list. It's open. You can subscribe to it. You can talk about anything. You can talk about the weather. It would be better focused on a perio-related activity, but subscribe to that list. Participate in a perio. We're an open community. We want to keep our membership dues low. We want to keep money in education, not to take it out of education. Uh, one way that you can help, having had the experience of Open Aperio 2017, is to think about helping with the preparation for next year's conference. And if you're an institution that uh, is not a member of a perio, think about having a conversation back home about that. Or become an individual member, because we've got that too. So in closing, uh, I really want to send two contrasting messages. A perio projects produce great software. Some of that software operates at very significant scale. But it's also true that great things often start as, as small collaborations. And we're a community and environment that nurtures such collaborations. But also, I'd like to send a contrasting message, or perhaps amplify one that Brian Ollendyke, a new member of the Aperio community, sent the other day in a presentation. Products are ephemeral, social movements are eternal. Let's keep that at the front of our minds for next year. Thanks for participating in Open Aperio 2017, and see you next year. Safe travels.